Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, welcome. I'm glad you found your way here. I had the devil of a time finding my way here with all the construction uh, going on. But I'm Robert George. I'm director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions, host of our lecture today, our 2023 Charles E. Test, MD, class of 37, distinguished lecture series. Charles Test was a medical doctor, a very distinguished one, uh, a dedicated alumnus of Princeton University, and honestly, the very first donor to the Madison program. Uh, he sent along some money undesignated just as we were founding the Madison program, and I got back in touch with him and asked him if we could use that money for founding the program, and he uh, graciously said that we could, and then he continued uh, for the rest of his life to be a loyal and generous donor to the program, and it's always a pleasure to remember him and to honor his memory. And what better way to do that than introducing to our community the distinguished Teresa Bejan, professor of political theory and fellow of Oriel College at Oxford University. Professor Bejan's research brings historical perspectives to bear in contemporary political theory. She's written on such themes as freedom of speech, civility, tolerance, and equality, writing always in an historical perspective. Her work ranges from the study of ancient Athens all the way up to the 21st century uh, English and American traditions. In 2021, she was the recipient, the laureate, for the Philip Leverhulme Prize in Politics, which celebrates early career researchers who've already achieved international acclaim and who have exceptional future promise. Professor Bijan's uh, first book, Mere Civility, subtitled Disagreement and the Limits of Tolerance, was published in 2017, and it examined contemporary calls for civility in light of the formative 17th century debates about toleration. Uh, she uh, has also published peer-reviewed articles in all the leading uh, journals in her field in American, the American Political Science Review, the American, of, uh, the American Journal of Political Science, Journal of Politics, Political Theory, and so forth and so on. She's got a special forum on the historical roles. That's the title, the historical roles, of course, referring to the, to the late and very great Harvard political philosopher John Rawls, which was published in 2021 in the journal Modern Intellectual History. In addition to her uh, professional contributions or contributions to professional journals and scholarship. She also writes for popular forums such as the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Atlantic Monthly. Her first lecture, the one delivered today, the first of the three uh, Charles E. Test lectures, is entitled, is it two? Did someone call that? Three, three yeah, three lectures is entitled An Equal Commonwealth. Please join me in welcoming Teresa Bejan. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. Is the mic level okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's really an honor to be here at the invitation of the James Madison program, and I want to thank Professor George, Professor Wilson, and also Christy Johnson for being such excellent hosts. I'm going to give three lectures, Robbie. I hope that's okay. Three? That's what I thought. We'll start with one, and we'll see how they go. Someone, okay. I thought I heard someone call out, too. When you reach a certain age, you hear voices. It's all right. Um, and the first one is indeed entitled An Equal Commonwealth. Okay, so I want to begin these lectures in the summer of 1646, so at the height of the English Civil War. That year in June, the leveler leader John Lilburn found himself once again in a London jail. The charge this time was contempt, contempt of parliament. So he'd been hauled before the House of Lords because he had, um, as they argued, libeled his former commander. And when called to uh, the Lords, Lilburn had not only refused to answer the charge, worse, he'd refused to kneel and he refused to remove his hat, denying that the House of Peers, as he called it, had any authority to judge a commoner like himself. The peers, alas, were unpersuaded. They confined Lilburn to Newgate Prison awaiting trial, at which point he shot off one of his many, many pithy pamphlets, this one entitled The Free Man's Freedom Vindicated, and it included a very famous postscript containing a general proposition. 
God, the absolute sovereign Lord and King, who made the world and all things therein, gave man his mere creature, the sovereignty under himself, and thereby created him after his own image, etc. Hence, every particular man and individual man and woman are and were by nature all equal and alike in power, dignity, authority, and majesty, none having by nature any authority, dominion, or magisterial power one over another. Notice that Lilburn here is arguing that neither men nor women can claim any power over others except by institution or donation, that is to say, by mutual agreement or consent. So the profound and profoundly political implications of this proposition would become clear the following autumn at the famous Putney debates, as we know them today. There, in October 1647, the New Model Army leadership, represented by Oliver Cromwell and his son-in-law, Henry Ireton, spent the better part of two weeks discussing what the post-war political settlement would look like. And they were debating this with a group of leveler agents, including a guy called William Petty, who's the first speaker on this slide, and also uh, certain agitators, as they were called, so representatives elected from the ordinary rank and file. So the levelers present at Putney presented General Cromwell with their manifesto entitled An Agreement, again, mutual agreement, An Agreement of the People. And on the second day, Colonel Thomas Rainborough stood up against his superior officers to defend the leveler principle of equal voice. So Rainborough very famously says, quote, for really I think that the poorest he that is in England hath a life to live as the greatest he. And therefore, truly, sir, I do think that the poorest man in England is not at all bound in a strict sense to that government that he hath not had a voice to put himself under. Now, it might disappoint some of you here to learn that Rainborough did not win the day at Putney. Uh, in Britain, universal manhood suffrage, as we call it, would take another 270 years. Votes for women would take another 10 years after that. But Rainborough's intervention in 1647 has long struck scholars as really remarkable. Uh, it was only discovered in an Oxford College library in the 1890s, which is also very interesting. So this was a, a real discovery. But in the hundred uh, years and more since it was discovered, Rainbow's statement has been kind of celebrated alongside Lilburn's as a high point in the history of equality. And more than that, the levelers themselves have been celebrated by historians and political theorists, but also by politicians and folk rock musicians as early egalitarians. Right. We identify them as being on the right side of history uh, and also way ahead of their time. That's not to say, though, that the levelers haven't been without their critics. As the Canadian Marxist C.B. McPherson pointed out in the early 1960s, at Putney, Rainbow and his colleagues would eventually agree to the exclusion of many poor he's from the franchise, specifically servants and alms takers. And feminists have long pointed out that no one seems to have spared a thought for the poorest she at Putney. It was just assumed that women would be excluded from the franchise, despite Lilburn's admirably inclusive postscript. And in more recent years, historians have grown increasingly disturbed by the coincidence, let's call it the coincidence, between leveler demands for equality and liberty on the one hand, and the slowly growing involvement of, the Engli of English merchants in the African slave trade. So these seems to be being occurring at the same moment in time. So what are we to make of the fact that someone like Lilburn is going to spend all of this time condemning England's lamentable slavery, as he called it, under the Norman yoke, uh, but passing over London merchants rising interest in enslaved Africans without comment? What are we to make of this? Now, the levelers would hardly be the first, nor indeed the last, egalitarians to conclude that some people were more equal than others. Or, uh, thanks to George Orwell. I like to call this the first among equals problem. So the phrase first among equals comes from the Latin primus inter pares, and it's the title of this lecture series and also the title of the book I'm currently writing on which the lectures are based. Um, and I think the first among equals problem is actually probably more familiar to American audiences uh, from an 18th century example, namely the American Declaration of Independence. Right? So it's now notorious that when Thomas Jefferson and his colleagues asserted that it was self-evident that men were created equal, that the British colonies of North America were nonetheless characterized by vast inequalities of wealth and status, and the revolution did little to undo these. These hierarchies and inequalities included racialized chattel slavery. So how are we to make sense of the fact that the founders believed on the one hand that all men were equal, 
but on the other hand, that some men were born slaves. Now, scholars will argue that we should regard the American founders, or indeed the levelers, exclusion of slaves or of women as blind spots. This is the phrase, blind spots. So the phrase suggests that such exclusions are unfortunate, maybe, but they're really incidental. So they're the product of historical prejudices that we ourselves have held about grown. So we remark upon them, but then we can move on. And certainly, it's still OK then to celebrate the egalitarian implications of these 18th century or 17th century arguments, um, even if the people who are making them didn't always see or otherwise follow through all of the egalitarian implications of, the, of their own statements. That's the blind spots view. So other scholars, and I think sort of increasingly more and more scholars, are not convinced by the blind spot argument at all. They see the exclusion of women or of slaves in the 17th century or the 18th not as blind spots, but as what we might call smoking guns. That is, as incontrovertible evidence that early modern European ideas of equality were linked inextricably with hierarchies of race and gender, as well as those of class. So I'm going to return to the theme of blind spots versus smoking guns in the last of these lectures, when I look at slavery and the place of women in leveler political thought specifically. But for now, I just want to observe that both, both the blind spot view and the smoking gun view, they share some significant assumptions. So firstly, they, they assume that what a 17th century author meant when they said that human beings are equal is broadly speaking what we mean. So dis the people in the distant past are understanding equality in the same way that we are. And if that's right, then institutions like slavery or patriarchal marriage are just an obvious contradiction with a commitment to equality. And on this view, the role of the historian becomes a, a kind of chronicler of contradictions. So what historians are meant to do is look at the past and look at all the ways in which a historical author or text sort of fell short of or was in contradiction with itself in, um, in uh, following through the implications of its egalitarian arguments. But of course, you know, polit the political theorists present will know that what we mean by equality isn't particularly clear either. So today, to say that human beings are equal can suggest many different things to different people. For some people, it means that humans are all the same. For others, it means that we're all different, but in ways equally deserving of respect. What philosophers today call basic equality can sometimes mean the sort of Benthamite principle of each should count for one and no one more than one. But for maybe neo-Kantians, it actually means something more like everyone is of inestimable dignity and value. And depending on how you understand the meaning of equality, then its implications are going to be very different. Right? We're going to think that human equality will have different, uh, will look different or have different, um, should have a different sort of normative force when we're considering how the state should treat its citizens or how people should treat one another. Now, the philosopher Bernard Williams once noted the discomfort, as he called it, arising from the conceptual confusions and contradictory demands of equality. But Williams concluded that these were, quote, no greater than with liberty or any other noble and substantial political ideal, unquote. But as a historian of political thought, you can't, I couldn't help but notice that equality has been spared the genealogical scrutiny to which the concept of liberty has been subjected by many, many, many historians, you know, beginning with Skinner's own seminal liberty before liberalism. And once noticed, the failure of historicism with respect to equality is really impossible to miss. So take, for instance, the term I've already been using thus far in this lecture, the term egalitarian. Well, the term egalitarian is a 19th century coinage. It refers to the popular legacy of the French Revolution and its commitment to egalité. But it's really striking that historians of political thought, intellectual historians, as well as political theorists, will just routinely deploy, deploy this label egalitarian in order to describe much earlier movements. And the consequence of this anachronism is to congratulate certain figures, perhaps the levelers, for being uh, ahead of their time, or otherwise to fault these figures for um, sometimes falling short of modern expectations. And so even a Cambridge School contextualist like Quentin Skinner himself will rely on the idea of human equality or basic equality to do a lot of implicit normative work in his historical account. So for instance, in Liberty Before Liberalism, uh, 
the early modern notion of Republican or neo-Roman liberty that Skinner recovers is a sort of, it, it's, what makes it attractive, according to Skinner, is that it can be reconciled with equality in a way that Berlin's negative or positive conceptions of liberty can't be. So again, it's a historical recovery that's predicated on an idea of equality doing this normative work in the background. And so, as a student of Skinner, I feel like it's my job now to just ask equality to submit patiently to contextualization, just like liberty before it. Okay, before I get going really though, I think um, maybe a few sort of uh, overarching observations are, are worth making. So what I wanna do in these lectures is go a little way towards recovering this lost history of equality before egalitarianism as I'll call it. Um, my special focus is going to be the middle decades of the 17th century in England as a pivotal moment during which the concept of equality begins to have really spectacular political consequences. Um, and specifically the equality of human beings, the idea that human beings as such are equal, begins to have political effects. As we'll see, that pivot the empowerment of equality is the work, I'll argue, of activists like Lilburn and not political philosophers. So partly what I'm doing in these lectures is decentering the great philosophers of the 17th century, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, as really reacting to and very often against what these activists were up to. So don't worry, I'll say a bit about Hobbes, I'll say a bit more about Locke in the third lecture, but again, it's trying to understand them as reacting to something that these other, um, these other people are doing. So again, I'm interested in the connection between practice and theory. Oftentimes, though, uh, philosophers especially tend to credit Hobbes and Locke with basically uh, credit them with inventing or otherwise putting human equality at the center of political thought um, and where it becomes this kind of defining premise of modern political thought. But that credit really is misplaced because not only does the idea of human equality actually have, you know, it, not only is it not a modern idea, it's an ancient idea. It's an ancient idea with really deep roots in Roman law and also in Christian theology. But also, when I say that the philosophers are reacting to what the activists are doing, I don't just mean the arguments they're making. I mean the gestures they're making as well. For instance, what they're doing with their hats. Okay. So Lilburn's refusal to take off his hat to the House of Lords. I'm going to suggest that this is actually a very striking thing, and that philosophers like Hobbes notice it. Now, from the perspective of the big questions of political philosophy, early modern conflicts over hat honor, doffing and donning can seem small. But of course, sometimes big ideas can be conveyed, if you will, by small gestures. And I would say, especially in this present moment of 2023, when we're still very concerned about contemporary controversies like microaggressions and the politics of pronouns, I think one of the really interesting things about the arguments you see in the 17th century is that they too remind us that it's really the sort of the micro politics of everyday interaction. That's the relational terrain, if you will, on which ideas of equality are forged and fought for. Now I say ideas of equality because as I hope to show you, a shared language of equality has historically masked a host of competing and sometimes very contradictory ideas about human beings and how they should relate to one another. So when, for instance, Samuel Johnson first published his Dictionary of the English Language in 1755, he included no fewer than eight definitions of the adjective equal, including indifferent or in just proportion, as well as like another in bulk or excellence, and also finally fit for any purpose. So to be equal was to be fit for any purpose. And so all of these definitions are gonna come up in the historical debates I'm gonna tell you about over the next few days. Okay, one final methodological caveat. As Quentin Skinner himself rightly reminds us, in tracing the history of a concept, one must be very careful not to conflate it with the history of a word, because a concept can exist in the absence of the particular term we happen to use to refer to it here and now. So that's surely right. But one of the things I'm really interested in is the peculiar power of equality, or more precisely, the peculiar power of equality talk in 
modern English, which I think derives in no small part from the word equality itself and its specifically mathematical and its juridical implications. So to use the word equality invokes a sense of not only of quantitative precision, but also transcendence. So I'm interested in the power of equality talk in moral and political philosophy. And what you see in, modern, in early modern English is also there's something special about the word equal. So the English word equal derives, of course, from the Latin word equalis. And so what happens in early modern English is that equal provides, if you will, a learned and Latinate alternative to a good old-fashioned Anglo-Saxon word, the word alike. So the English word alike is cognate with the German gleich. Okay, we've actually seen this already in Lilburn's postscript containing a general proposition. So he's using two terms here, equal and alike. And so one of the things I'm interested in, if you will, is the politics of language here and how the word equality becomes attached to a particular idea, namely the idea that human beings as such share some intrinsic status, uh, share some fundamental status or intrinsic worth. And I'm gonna argue that part of that story is a story of fairly contingent translation choices that are made by legal commentators and theologians in the 16th and 17th centuries, which end up making certain ideas about, certain thoughts about human relations thinkable in a way that they simply hadn't been before. Okay, so keeping in this in mind, Let's return now to Lilburn and Rainbow and see if we can't get a clearer sense of what they were up to and what equality meant for them. Although the Levelers were active for only about six years during the latter part of the Civil War, they enjoy a really outsized reputation among modern scholars. We know a lot about the Levelers, but they weren't around very long. The best modern historian of the movement, Rachel Foxley, has argued that, look, the Levelers were a populist movement. They're not an organized political party. And that's right. We shouldn't exaggerate their organization or indeed the kind of coherence of their program. It's a movement that coalesces around the pre-existing celebrity of John Lilburn as a Puritan martyr. So in the late 1630s, Lilburn had been, uh, he had been um, tried before the infamous Court of Star Chamber for an unlic unlicensed printing. And that court had ordered that Lilburn be brutally flogged, pilloried, and imprisoned. So Lilburn is finally released in the earliest years of the Long Parliament after a popular petitioning campaign. So Lilburn's career as a martyr is already well established by 1646. When the Civil War broke out in 1642, Lilburn immediately enlisted in the parliamentary army, but he resigned his commission three years later over a disagreement with his commanding officer. He then continues the campaign in print, I think is the way to say it. He begins writing these pamphlets criticizing his uh, former commander and turning his zeal for the rights of freeborn Englishmen against his former allies. So while Parliament is fighting against the crown during the Civil War, Lilburn and his colleagues are taking aim at the Presbyterians in Parliament, and then the House of Lords, and then the House of Commons, and then after the regicide, the Republican Council of State, which ends up becoming the executive in the English Commonwealth before uh, Cromwell assumes the, the position of Lord, of, of Lord Protector. So generally the way to understand this is that the Levelers are going to be attacking whoever happens to have Lilburn and his colleagues and also their wives very often imprisoned at any given moment. And it's important to remember that the term leveler, like many other early modern labels or denominations that we still use today, actually began as a pejorative. I'll explore the label of leveling and kind of the practices it referred to tomorrow. But for now, I'm just gonna say that when their opponents called them levelers, Lilburn and his colleagues were very adamant that this was mistaken. They had no interest in economic leveling or in no hostility to private property. What they wanted, they said, was legal and political reform based on the idea that the benefits of law and liberty were the birthright of every freeborn English man and woman. As the war progressed, the levelers became more increasingly interested in uh, political reform. And so it's due to their growing influence within the New Model Army that they end up getting this position. They get a platform at Putney uh, and access to the army leadership in order to uh, argue for their ideas. So the Putney debates really mark the high point of leveler influence. 
So there, the agitators and sympathizers like Rainbow defended an agreement of the people and its demands for a suitably reformed House of Commons to be the supreme political authority in England. And Rainbow's memorable intervention came on the second day during a spat with Lieutenant Colonel Ireton about the franchise. So famously, Ireton had argued that some property qualifica qualifications ought to be maintained um, for electing members to parliament, while Rainbow argued for the principle that every man, even the poorest, has a voice by nature and therefore should be entitled to a vote. Um, so the way that the Putney debates have been received for a long time has basically been to say, well, look, it's the levelers and sympathizers like Rainbow who are arguing for equality at Putney and the grandees, so Ireton and Cromwell, who are arguing against it. Um, and certainly the eventual exclusion of servants and alms takers, as well as women from the franchise seem to, to uh, say, well, in the end, equality lost at Putney. But I think we really need to be careful about anachronism here, because Rainbow himself had been elected MP for Droitwich earlier in 1647 by an electorate of under 30 voters. So, it's just <laughs> so we need to get this idea that somehow, the idea that every person in England was going to have a vote, it just, just out, of, out of our heads. Um, and again, I think because also we need to get past this misreading of the debates. Because what strikes the careful reader about Putney is that all sides agree that a more equal representation is desirable. So the agitators and the grandees are disagreeing about how to equalize representation. Should seats, be, should seats in parliament be assigned on the basis of population or on property? Um, and while the levelers are arguing that, um, as they say in the agreement, they say, quote, uh, so they say parliamentary seats, quote, ought to be more indifferently proportioned. So they say an equal distribution is an indifferent one. Ireton, in his Heads of the Proposals, argues that no, the rule of equality is a, is a rule of proportion, according to which we should assign votes and seats on the basis of people's interest in landed property. And indeed, if you read a, a lot of Ireton, as, 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 as I do, Ireton is more obsessed with equality than anyone in the 16, uh, in 1646-47. He's obsessed with the idea of equality and how exactly it's to be achieved in the English Constitution. So in pitting two ideas of equality against each other, which is what we see at Putney, an idea of equality as quantitative identity or indifference, and an idea of equality as proportional, proportionable distribution, the readers of Aristotle present, present will notice that this is, an old, this is an old debate, an ancient debate about distributive justice. Aristotle had famously followed Plato in identifying two kinds of equality, what he labeled arithmetic and geometric, respectively. So the former principle uh, dictates that strictly equal or indifferent shares should be given to everyone. And the latter argues that no, equal shares should go to those who are themselves equal in merit or worth only, hence unequal shares to unequals. But I would argue that in both cases, the idea of equality as indifference and the, equality, the idea of equality as proportion, respectively, are actually just specifications of, of an even more fundamental conception of equality. And this is what I would call equality as balance. So in Greek, to ison, or the equal, the, the metaphor here you've got to think of is of a scale, even, that's an even or level scale that's evenly balanced between two weights. And so the objects that are being weighed are different, and yet they are indifferent with respect to, quant to, with, 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 with respect to uh, weight. Okay? So the question then is, okay, what, so to be equal is to be balanced. And then we argue about what the appropriate balancing strategy really is. Um, so Aristotle, partly what's going on uh, in that discussion is that he's pointing out that even Athenian Democrats who are arguing for a kind of arithmetic understanding of equality in the distribution of offices in democracy, they're actually assuming that an indifferent or arithmetic distribution of political power is appropriate because adult male Athenian citizens are just obviously intrinsically superior <laughs> to all of the people who are excluded from political power in Athens. So, female citizens, obviously, but also slaves and foreigners. 
So the idea of political equality in Athenian democracy is really an idea of um, what we might call parity or peerage. It's the idea that democratic citizens are peers. They're high status equals who have a kind of epistemic dignity, to borrow a phrase from Melissa Schwartzberg, and, they and so they should be counted. They should be counted politically while other people should be excluded. And I think that's what really what Aristotle's pointing out, that even the Democrats are presuming a proportionality principle in the way that they argue for political equality. So this distinction between equality on the one hand and parity on the other is gonna become important, but I just wanna flag it for now. Um, here the key point is that in ancient Greek debates and then also in early sort of Roman Republican debates about equality as a political ideal, it's really being understood as a principle of balance. It's a question of how do you balance a constitution? And so the theory is that while balancing a constitution requires careful calibration, it means counting the people who should count in the right way and not counting the people who shouldn't count, right? Not letting that unbalance your body politic. Um, and so the idea of equality is also an artificial idea. So art equality isn't natural. It's a kind of achievement of human ingenuity. And the assumption is that an equal uh, political equality uh, is predicated on the assumption of human inequality. So human beings are not equal, but therefore we must kind of create equality in the commonwealth by distinguishing between better and worse. And that, I think, is still the primary sense of equality in play at Putney. Equality is balance. And that makes sense, because what's happening in the 1640s is that there is a revival of, a deliberate revival of these ancient Republican arguments about equality by English Republicans like John Milton and James Harrington. So they too are very concerned about how to equalize the body politic. And so the English Civil War, I'd argue, is, is partially a debate about just what is the most equal form of commonwealth. And in this context, someone like Harrington is gonna argue that equalizing or liberating, as he says, so calibrating, so liberating the body, body politic requires a complex array of balancing mechanisms, one of which is uh, agrarian laws, which are going to limit the accumulation of landed property. But also Harrington thinks that you're gonna have to introduce fine gradations of the citizenry to make sure that people, you know, that not everybody has a voice. Harrington thinks we need to actually silence large swaths of the population in order to get an equal commonwealth. So the point is that in 17th century England, as in classical Athens, a commitment to political equality does not an egalitarian make. And perhaps that's a really simple point, but if you read a lot of the scholarship like I do, it seems to be a point that's lost on a lot of academics. <laughs> So when you see the word equality, it doesn't mean that someone is an egalitarian, right? Okay. There is, of course, a key difference between the way that someone like Milton is thinking about political equality and the way that someone like Cicero, for instance, is thinking about political equality. The difference, of course, is that Milton is a Christian, and he's committed also to the idea that human beings as such are equal, okay? So uh, let's look at the history of that claim. We sometimes forget it, but the equality of human beings by nature is an ancient idea with deep roots in Roman law. So I have for you the celebrated extract from the Emperor Justinian's uh, sixth century digest of Roman law. So the claim omnes homines aequales sunt is traced here back to the third century jurist Ulpian and also through him to Sabinus, who's a first century jurist. So the idea of human equality with respect to natural law here is seen as being fully consistent and indeed supportive of, I would argue, the hierarchies of all sorts that characterize Roman life. So these include the hierarchy of master over slave, men over women, fathers over families, and Roman citizens over anyone, of everyone else. And so the point for jurists, though, is that equality with respect to natural law is about a kind of universal status. So every human being as such is equally subject or obligated, obligated with respect to the natural law. The natural law does not bear differently on different kinds of people. It bears equally on everyone. So here again, I think the sense of equality in play is, is as indifference 
To say that human beings are equal is to say that the law should bear on everyone without exception, but this is much like death and other inescapable features of the human condition. So there are good sort of stoic arguments about equality and you know, our, our sort of vulnerability to death. So in Latin, to say that human beings are naturally equal in their status as human beings is not at all to say that they are also peers or pares with respect to their worth or intrinsic uh, yeah, it, it, virtue or value. And so again, here again, we have that distinction between equality on the one hand and parity on the other. In Latin, equalitas and peritas. So the phrase primus inter pares, from which I take my title, I'll talk about this more on Wednesday, that's, that's a claim about for, first among peers, and we translated this first among equals, but this is an important difference. So Cicero, for instance, is going to point out that look, you can be equals with respect to age, so everyone is, has the same number of years, but not peers with respect to virtue. So Roman legal commentators think that all human beings as human beings are equal insofar as they're universally subjected to law, albeit of different kinds and in different ways. But those human beings could and would also be judged according to their disparate merits. And so ordered with reference to their uh, differences in worth. And so the appeal of this legalistic vision of equality to Christians on the fringes of the Roman Empire, I think should be obvious. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus links this idea of equal or indifferent subjection to the law uh, implicitly with human beings' creation imago dei in Genesis. So Jesus compares God's image in man to Caesar's stamp on the denarius or the silver coin. It's translated as penny in the King James Version. In another important episode in Acts, Peter meets a Roman centurion who bows down to him. And Peter tells him to stand up. He tells Cornelius the centurion that the Christian God is non exceptio personarum, or no acceptor of persons. Here the King James has respecter, which will become important. But Peter's point here is that much like the natural law, the Christian God is going to judge all humans indifferently. It's going to judge everyone universally but then reward individuals in proportion to their spiritual merits, not their earthly position, possessions, or external persona or faith. So that's where that idea of the person comes from. So as a matter of indifference, then, human equality does not imply political equality in any of these ancient arguments, let alone parity, this idea that all humans are somehow peers, no. It does, however, promise that the hierarchically ordered distinctions by which superiors preside rightly over inferiors on earth are going to give way to more perfectly just versions of those hierarchies in the hereafter. So many Christians believe that the just hierarchies that God will put in place are actually going to take the form of a great reversal or inversion. Right, so this is the idea of the Beatitudes, the last shall be first, the meek shall inherit. Right, so what we're going to have is we have this hierarchy, and we're just going to flip it. Right, and that's how God will equalize. Right? But again, the key point here is that human equality as a kind of universal subjection is not only not an egalitarian premise, it's actually a kind of normatively hierarchical premise. Equality means that those who have power in this world whether they be princes or priests or masters of slaves, should humble themselves, should be aware of their subjection, and become godlike in the conscientious performance of their duties, their sort of differential duties that they have in virtue of being placed in the superior position. So their office is in charitable service. But it also means that the downtrodden can be comforted by the prospect that the proud are also subjects and will be weighed by God in turn. So uh, Pope Gregory the Great, for instance, in his commentary on Job, he says, all will be weighed in an equal balance in the end. Okay. So if we return to 17th century England in light of this history, I think we can see now not only the debate that the levelers were intervening in, but also the way in which they were innovating with respect to that debate. So to modern readers, Lilburn's postscript, much like Rainbow's Putney's speech, stand out, stands out as a revolutionary statement of human equality. But if you go to the parliamentary archives in London, you can actually look at the copies of Lilburn's pamphlet that the prosecutor used to convict him of contempt. 
And one of the most striking things is that the prosecutor did not care about the postscript containing a general proposition. So while the other bits of the pamphlet are marked up as being filled with criminality, the postscript doesn't merit a second look. And I think that's because, you know, we read this as a revolutionary statement, but in fact, in the context of the 1640s, the equality of human beings is not a new idea gaining acceptance. It's actually a theological and juridical commonplace, right? One that had for centuries few, if any, of the social and political consequences that modern egalitarians expect. Indeed, the idea of human equality was so ubiquitous that in the 1630s, so a full decade before Lilburn pens his proposition, John Locke's bet noir, Robert Filmer, in Patriarcha, complains, quote, that the supposed natural equality of mankind had achieved the status of a truth unquestionable. But equity requires that an ear be reserved a little for the negative. So Filmer's complaining that everyone thinks human beings are equal. Let's entertain the thought that they could be unequal. What would that look like? Okay? So Filmer obviously is worried about the kinds of natural law arguments that are being made by, for instance, Cardinal Bellarmine. So you get in the 16th uh, century this rise in arguments about natural equality according to which because humans are naturally equal, there is no way that a just God would have, lift, would have elevated one over the other and made him king. So this is the Bellarmine argument. It's an argument for popular sovereignty. Natural equality means that a god of justice will not distinguish one man from another, and therefore political power must originally be in the body as a whole. And for decades now, historians of political thought have um, been interested in that argument, and sort of seen how Protestants adopted that argument and sort of used it against their Catholic sovereigns, and that's what frustrated Filmer. And from his perspective, things got really bad in England in the 1640s because you begin to get these parliamentarians using that popular sovereignty argument to justify armed resistance to the crown. So people like Henry Parker will make the natural equality argument and also Samuel Rutherford, the author of Lex Rex. Rutherford will argue, quote, things which agree to man by nature agree to all men equally and all men are not born kings, as is evident this isn't on the slide, but no man cometh out of the womb with a diadem on his head or a scepter in his hand. That's the Rutherford argument. But of course, for neither, neither Rutherford nor Parker are going to see human equality as a kind of um, good to be protected, right? Or it's the basis for a moral or legal claim. Equality is more of a negative principle. It's a way of clearing out clearing out the way, uh, different claims to uh, authority. Natural liberty, then, is, is the value on which we're going to claim and sort of demand that, uh, that our natural liberty needs to be protected. By contrast, equality functions as this critical principle. As in Rutherford, we're sort of stripped naked, and then we can see that we're all equally subject by birth, which means that we can't then elevate one person over the other. But of course, Rutherford will go on to say that equality is consistent with all of these gradations of worth or value. So all of these forms of subordination and subjection that he thinks are in some way natural. And strikingly, he not only cites uh, Aristotle on natural slavery, he also cites Plato in the laws <laughs> to say some men are as of gold and fit to rule and others of iron and clay. And that's in the context of an argument about equality. Okay. So there's that equality and parity distinction I mentioned to you before. And so here I think we can finally see, okay, what Lilburn is doing is really different. So the parliamentary prosecutors don't care about the equality claim, but they do care about the claims, the, the context in which that claim is being made. So you, if you look at what they did highlight in the Freeman's Freedom Vindicated, for instance, uh, this partial passage about Magna Carta. And therefore, my lords, you being peers, as you are called, merely made by prerogative and never entrusted or empowered by the Commons of England with the original, and fountain of, uh, the original and fountain of power, Magna Carta, the Englishman's legal birthright and inheritance, hath justly, rationally, and well provided that your lordship shall not sit in judgment or pass sentence in criminal cause upon any commoner of England, but that all commoners in such cases shall be tried only by their peers and equals, that is to say, their fellow commoners. <laughs> 
<clears throat> Lilburn is ultimately convicted in 1646 of contempt of parliament. And I think reading this passage, we can see why. What he's doing is he's assailing the parity of English peers, saying that the House of Peers are not his peers, and therefore they have no right to judge, men, judge him. And so if we revisit Lilburn's postscript in light of this, I think we can see that what he's doing in this passage is reimagining natural equality not as an indifference principle, but as a parity principle. So when Lilburn says that men and women are always equal and alike, using both of these language, languages, equality and likeness, he's using the language of likeness to argue that in addition to this basic juridical status, every human being is also alike enough with respect to certain valuable traits specifically power, dignity, authority, and majesty, okay? These are things that we tend to think of as positional goods. So that means simply to say that, you know, this good is valuable insofar as it's unequally distributed throughout the population. So authority, for instance. Authority is good because if I have authority, it generally means you don't, right? So here, though, Lilburn is saying that we're equal and alike with respect to the possession of these uh, positional goods. Richard Overton, in An Arrow Against Tyrants, is going to put the, the thought uh, like this. He's going to say, quote, by natural birth, all men are equally and alike born to like propriety, liberty, and freedom. And we are delivered of God by the hand of nature into this world. Even so are we to live, everyone equally and alike, to enjoy his birthright and privilege. Okay. So the language of privilege in the language of birthright here are telltale signs that what the levelers are doing is not just claiming equality, they're claiming natural parity. They are claiming that every man and woman by birth is not just equal, they are also a peer. So not only are Lilburn and Overton doing this, this begins to spread throughout the leveler movement. And I've just given you one example, which is the plea of William Thompson. But you can really see the dynamic here, where Thompson is saying that, as a commoner of England, I am therefore, thereby entailed and entitled. So this is, key, this is clear aristocratic language to an equal privilege. And so I, I'll call, in the, I like to call this the logic of leveling. So if you can establish that human beings are peers by birth, then you can say that the less advantaged should always be treated as well as the most advantaged. And so this is why the levelers' arguments begin to get traction. They're beginning to claim the rights of peerage for themselves as commoners. And that includes things like the right to a trial by jury of their peers. What's happening here is they're trading on an ambiguity in the translation of Magna Carta, and they get this from Edward Cook's commentary on Magna Carta. Cook observes that you can translate per legali uh, judicium parium suorum, so this idea of trial by jury of his peers. You can translate peers in that passage, Cook observes, as peers or equals. So Lilburn's not a lawyer. He's not very good at Latin. But he re reads Cook's commentaries in prison, and he gets really excited. So he begins to disseminate this language throughout leveler texts. Leading finally to the arguments of leveler women in various petitions uh, they themselves handed into parliament. So I'm gonna to return to the leveler women's petition on Wednesday, but for now I just wanna point out that they're beginning with a claim of their equal creation with men, and here tying that immediately to a political claim. That is that insofar as we are equals in creation, we are also entitled to a proportionable share of the freedoms of the Commonwealth. That's really radical. That's really interesting. That hadn't been happening before. So my argument about the levelers is that it's not just equality that's doing the work, it's parity. And as evidence for my argument that it's not just equality, I submit that I am not the only person <laughs> who thought that the claims that the levelers were making were not about saying that they were equals, but also that they were peers, okay? So Oliver Cromwell, for instance, himself, is going to complain about those who drive at leveling and parity, as he calls it, and want to destroy the ranks and orders of men by which this kingdom hath been known for, a hundred, uh, for, for, uh, for hundreds of years. But I think the most perspicuous critic of the leveler movement and their claims to equality as parity or peerage is, of course, Thomas Hobbes. 
So when Hobbes began writing Leviathan in 1651, the levelers were still an uncomfortably recent memory as mutineers and accused traitors to the new regime. So contemporaries would no, thus no doubt have recognized in his famous description of the natural condition of mankind in chapter 13, a kind of satire on Lilburn and Overton's original position. So in Hobbes' state of nature, individuals are as little lordlings engaged in suicidal status competition, trying to vindicate their natural superiority, again, because they're claiming an equal share of certain positional goods, which leads inevitably to conflict. And yet, the strangest thing of all is that Hobbes ultimately embraces the image of leveling in Leviathan, both in his chosen title and also in its striking cover image of a giant towering over a plane made up of countless miniature individuals. And if you look closely, you can see that almost every man in this crowd of common people is still wearing his hat. This is in the presence of their sovereign. So as ever, so Hobbes' great critic is uh, Edward Hyde, the Earl of Clarendon. And so the Earl of Clarendon complains that you know, his timing is always wrong. Uh, when he, he complains that Hobbes publishes Leviathan, quote, when the levelers were at their highest, right? That's not right. In 1651, the leveler movement was already, uh, was already collapsed. Um, they were prosecuted. They were put on trial for treason. But it's certainly the case that in Leviathan, Hobbes is drawing attention to the kinds of claims that the levelers were making. And Clarendon is right to point out how little Hobbes tries to distance himself from them in that book. Instead, he enthusiastically brace, embraces the image of leveling, and then he gives us this really provocative image. And so we're gonna see tomorrow, however, that Lilburn and his colleagues were not the only levelers that Hobbes had in his sights in Leviathan. There were many more motley crews of self-styled true levelers, groups that we know today as the diggers, the ranters, and the early Quakers. And so tomorrow, I'm going to look more closely at the figure of leveling and also the practices of digging and quaking by which these self-styled true levelers sought to turn the world upside down and what Hobbes had to say about it. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. The floor is open. Yes, Professor Still. Really enjoyed that. It's very interesting. Um, so I have a, a quick question. Um, it's about the idea of parody mm -hmm. and the claim that the levelers were making, in your view, when they extend parody uh, to all citizens. So oh, you first gloss parody is the idea that we should. Um, treat equally those who have a, a quality in a given proportion, mm -hmm. right? So if, if two people both have the quality in proportion X, then we should treat them equally, but if someone has the proportion less than X, then we might treat them unequally. Um, but you also said that equality is an artificial ideal, idea, that um, people aren't in fact equal, but we um, create equality through the commonwealth. So I'm wondering how those two claims go together because um, the notion of parity seems to me to indicate that there's some natural basis mm -hmm. um, on which we might claim that people are peers. There's some trait or quality or property that people have in a certain proportion and we're responding to that by treating them in, as having a given dignity. But the idea that equality is an artificial construction mm. um, seems to indicate that, that we're not necessarily responding to anything. It's, we're just kind of creating it out of thin air. So I, I guess, which one do you think the levelers actually thought? Yeah, that's uh, very helpful. Um, and it's an excellent question. So I think partly what's going to happen in the 17th and then in the 18th centuries is that equality becomes naturalized. So when I say that equality was an artificial ideal, that's really this kind of ancient and pre-modern way of seeing it. Um, now, the distinction between equality and parity is a really interesting one, and I haven't been able to do it justice here because I've been focusing just on the 17th century story. But in Aristotle, for instance, or in these kind of democratic debates in Athens, um, 
the Democrats don't distinguish between what I would call equality and parity. It's just the same word. It's to ison, it's isotes. The idea are we're equal with respect to um, uh, axia, worth, and therefore we should have an equal share in the uh, isomoira in the um, offices of the Commonwealth. But it's really in the Roman context that these concepts come apart. Uh, and so if I were sort of to specify, well, what really, what's the difference? I think parity is not, equality implies the possibility of measurement. So we can actually sort of stack people up in terms of their worth and sort of say, okay, you're, you're worth more by this number of degrees. Whereas parity is more about judgment and discrimination. I can sort of look at two objects that are different and don't, maybe not even, sh don't even share a unit of measure and nevertheless say they are on a par with respect to value. Um, and so in a way, what I'm trying to do is to show this, this is kind of something really um, awkward about trying to combine a parity premise on the one hand, which I think is what the levelers are creating, with an equality conclusion. Because I, I think there is, a, there is a mismatch there, and it's a mismatch I think that's finessed then in, this way, in, the, sort of in the language that the levelers are using. Um, so it just, I, the more general point, I guess, is that you know, the idea that philosophers and political theorists, what we call basic equality, so you have equality as a premise and that leads naturally to kind of equality as a conclusion. I'm trying to get, sort of get away from that and sort of realize that actually the premises and conclusions don't fit together in these earlier arguments in the way that they think that they should. So how did that happen? You know, how do we get to where we are where it seems so obvious? Thanks. Okay, good. Next. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, she's going to bring the microphone in. We, we can hear you, but the microphone gets it on the video. Um, on a similar note, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on um, the evolution of equality um, as something that was artificially constructed because um, you mentioned like the Athenians and Aristotle was very much a big appealer to reason and then much later we have Aquinas um, discussing Christian theology's natural law and um, I just kind of have the impression of equality kind of deeply rooted in both of those um, schools of thought. So I'm interested to hear um, those more natural and reasonable tendencies, how that relates to um, your argument about like more artif artificially created equality. What's your name? Olivia. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah, so um, in the book, <laughs> there are, uh, I have two chapters that are basically on the kind of pre-modern, so ancient and medieval, and obviously I'm really interested in Christian uh, arguments about natural equality. Okay, and certainly Aquinas is a really interesting example, because Aquinas in the Summa relies on precisely this distinction between equality and parity. So what, what Aquinas argues is that in the state of innocence, humans are naturally equal, but they are nevertheless dispares, disparata, which means that there is in fact government and order in the state of equality, right? And so that I think is a great example of an important conceptual distinction that gets lost through the act of translation and the presentation of texts in modern English editions for students. You know, we sort of read this and say, oh, it's oh, equality, they're equal in the state of innocence. You know, we, we, we need to sort of reacquaint ourselves with the profoundly hierarchical assumptions that are structuring these arguments. And in a way, also, speaking of different traditions and, and Aquinas, but we might also think of Augustine here as being really important, the idea that the way that Christians reconciled natural equality on the one hand with uh, sort of earthly hierarchies on the other was exclusively through the fact of original sin. So it's sin that introduces domination, according to uh, Augustine and, and, you know, the, and others. But again, the distinction there is between different kinds of rule. So dominating rule is being rule that relies on coercion and punishment, as opposed to kind of uh, coactive or consensual rule in which the superior and inferior parties recognize the justice <laughs> of their differential placement. Um, so, so, yeah, so, but partly this is a project of um, defamiliarizing and kind of alienate, alienating ourselves from arguments that kind of have appeared to us in one way and trying to recover some lost ways of seeing the world. 
Yes, up here. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, you mentioned uh, Robert Bellarmine in connection to the uh, popular sovereignty argument. Uh, I was wondering if you could please elaborate on how that squares or doesn't square with um, the sort of wider, longer theological tradition that holds to a more hierarchical view of government. Mm. Yeah, so I don't want to um, ignore or downplay the importance of these popular sovereignty arguments. Um, they're absolutely important. But what I want to do is kind of disaggregate between the kind of equality claims and the liberty claims that sometimes get pushed together in, uh, in the way that we now sort of receive and study these traditions. So <clears throat> the sort of popular sovereignty argument that Bellarmine is gonna make and others are gonna make, which I said leads to, basically equality is a way of evacuating all of the claims to natural authority that are being made. So you sort of say it's clearing those away. So you get a kind of a vacuum, I think is the right way to put it. But there's still a sense that, you know, for someone like Bellarmine, it's not the case then that individuals then get to rise up and exercise their rights. It's the idea that popular sovereignty resides in the collective, but then it must be represented by someone, right? And so certainly the way that the argument then gets taken up in the English case is to say, well, it's the House of Commons that represents the people. There's never a sense then that these naturally equal individuals can then therefore act and sort of speak for themselves, right? Um, so that's the, that's the move I'm interested in. I mean, a point that was implicit in what I've said, but maybe I should make explicit, when I say that it's the work of activists to really get these arguments going, partly it's because I don't think the arguments work as arguments, <laughs> right? So there's a way in which the argument works politically so Lilburn's argument works fantastically. Sure, he gets convicted for contempt, he gets thrown in the Tower of London, but when it comes to his actual treason trial, every time he gets a trial of his fellow commoners, he's acquitted. It's an excellent argument, right? But in terms of does it actually work to say that you can universalize a kind of elevated status that has these positional goods? I mean, Francisco Suarez said that it cannot be the, it, it can't, universal lordship is, is impossible. That's not, that's, that's, a, you know, that's, that's incoherent. But there's a way in which over time these incoherent claims, we can begin to make them work. So that's the thought. So Teresa, let me try just one of my own. This is really a conceptual point and I'm not sure how it relates to the history of, if, if at all. Uh, am I on? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, here's the conceptual. Okay. Uh, anybody's gonna recognize that people are different, and not only different, but unequal in certain important respects, respects that matter. People are gonna notice that some people are more intelligent than other people. Uh, some people are stronger, some weaker. Uh, some more handsome or beautiful, others uh, not so much. And so forth and so on. Anybody would recognize that, all times, all places. And they'll notice that those things reasonably matter for certain purposes, athletics, sometimes for authority, who should be in charge of this or that because of particular talents or intelligence or whatever. But if you're a biblical believer, if you're Jewish or Christian, uh, all that would then be considered against the background normative understandings that are, that are informed by what we might call a low equality and a high equality mm and a future and final equality. The low equality is the recognition that anyone and everyone, no matter how smart, no matter how strong, no matter how beautiful, is fashioned from the mere dust of the earth. Because nobody's made from better stuff. Everybody's really low. <laughs> but at the same time, for the biblical believer, there's the high equality. Everybody, though fashioned from the mere dust of the earth, is made in the very image and likeness of the divine creator and ruler of all that is. And if you're Aquinas, for example, you understand that to mean, not that God has five fingers on each of two hands and hair on his head and a nose, but rather that one has the godlike powers of reason and freedom. Mm -hmm. One can be an agent. And then there's the ultimate and final equality that everybody, no matter how high, no matter how low, strong, weak, beautiful, intelligent, not so much, 
is going to finally be answerable before the judgment throne of God. And that's a radical equality. So for those figures, those, be they activists or, or theorists who are biblical believers, in this case mm -hmm. Christians, how does that tie together for them? How does, the, how, does the, how does the biblical understanding shape how they process all the ways in which they're different? So that's a very rich and complicated question. And I can say that tomorrow I'm going to be looking much more closely at particular scriptural uh, claims and different pr the importance of different proof texts in making uh, particular equality claims. So maybe I'll... Yeah, sort of say, I'll get to tomorrow, sort of the specific. So, because, I mean, so the, 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 the uh, preview answer to, to your question is that there's not one way of understanding this, and different groups are going to rely on very different proof texts to making the claim. I think there's a sort of assumption, and, and it's one that, that um, was implicit in your question, which is actually the key proof text is always going to be Genesis 126, 127. It's going to be creation imago Dei that's doing the work. But what they mean the image and likeness of God. Yeah, so the fact that human beings are dust um, and also are made in the image and likeness mm -hmm. of God. Um, the Leveler Women's Petition, for instance, is a good example. That since we are assured of our creation in the image of God and of an interest in Christ equal unto men. And that, I think, fits the expectation of the kind of biblical equality claim we should see. But I'm going to argue that actually different proof texts are uh, cited, and the, the, that sort of the pattern of citation reflects conceptual differences in how equality is being understood. So equality as a kind of universal subjection, I think that is very often captured by the image of God. So we bear God's image in the way that the coin bears Caesar's image. It shows that we are subject. To God, we have the same sovereign. But the um, the Acts ten thirty four claim. So God is no respecter of persons. So that is relying on this idea that the equality. I mean, it's related to the Imago Dei claim, perhaps. But the idea that equality um, that we are unequal on the outside, but equal within. So God sees through us. Through the, through the stamp to the stuff. So the idea of persona here is it's, it's, it's the idea of the mask, but it becomes an important legal term. So your persona is sort of your, posi your position under the law. So God is no respecter of persons means that God sort of looks through the differences of slave and master, potter, familius, and filius, all these things, and sees through to the soul of what's within. So you get the internal, external um, distinction. But then also you're going to get these radical claims in the Quakers, for instance, tomorrow of um, the key proof text being uh, Galatians or Colossians, the idea of God, you know, uh, there is no Jew or Gentile, but Christ is all in all. So an idea of spiritual unity, we're all in fact one. And so I would just want to point out that there's no one Christian way of conceiving of equality. There's actually this diversity of ways. And that diversity is reflected then in the different proof texts that we use to make the argument. Um, and the way that you've uh, distinguished, Robbie, between the sort of high equality as the image and the low equality of the dustiness, I like that very much because it sort of captures what I think is distinctive about Imago Dei or argu arguments often, which is this idea that human beings are not equal under their creator, but we are alike to him. And basically, it's up to us to do our best to um, live up to the image of God in us, so to become godlike is that adjective, you know, godlike princes. Those are the ones who are doing their best to live up to the image of God, but are also aware that they will never be equal to God. They are inferior. So that sort of, that sort of directionality there, I think, is really important. The altitudinal dimension, you might call it, of equality. I'm trying to remember the context of Acts 10, 25, uh, and then what's in the ellipses. <laughs> Nothing important. Is it, if we, in, in context, is Peter there dealing with the fact that Cornelius is a Gentile? And so he's having this, I don't know if the word for it is revelation or mm -hmm. epiphany, that, that the, the Gentiles are in two now. 
that, 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 that the mission now is not just to our own people, but to, to, to all people. Yeah, so, so what I've cut, I mean, what I've cut out here, I think that's right. Um, so it's uh, Cornelius the centurion falls down he's a, he's a Roman at his Gentile. feet. He's a exactly, pagan. yeah, he's a Roman, he's a pagan. Um, and then Peter says, stand up, I am also a man. Mm -hmm. And it's revealed to me that God is no respecter of persons. And by respecter of persons means it doesn't matter that he's not Jewish. Well, ex I mean, yes, yeah. and... I mean, that seems to be a big part of what's meant, that the distinction between Jew and Gentile is now overcome. It's no longer relevant. There's a kind of universalism uh -huh, uh -huh. of subjection. So we're all subject to one God. But there's also, a, so my argument is that there's also a kind of reflection of the kind of distinctions of different kinds of law and our status relative to them. So the persona language, I think, is important. Awesome. And so in the Greek, uh, I'll talk about this tomorrow, you get the claim that God is um, a prosopolemptus, right? That God is not partial to faces. It's <laughs> actually what it is in Greek. And then in Latin, it gets non acceptio personarum. It's not, does not accept faces. Um, and so it's, it's a legalistic language that I think is important and sort of calls up this kind of Roman juridical context. Yes, sir. Oh, <laughs> oh and, then, and then you're next, because I, I, I saw your hand up over there. But Christy, over here, and then I'm going to make you run all the way back. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Teresa. As always, you know, just such a rich tour de force. I'm not going to ask a question about Aristotle or your genealogy, which I'm actually, I think, fully persuaded by, oh, but a slightly unfair question about equality after egalitarianism. Mm. I think a few times um, you suggested you know, that you were um, focusing on a particular rupture or break in the 17th century, and that um, unlike uh, equality under egalitarianism, here in this pre-egalitarian context, there was a sense of talking about equality that was perfectly compatible with treating people unequally. Mm. And the, the contrast seemed to be that, that, that that's not what happens under egalitarianism. And so I wanted to ask, to ask what, is the, what is the rupture here that exactly happens? Because it seems to be that even equality under egalitarianism is perfectly consistent with treating people unequally. What seems to shift is instead, you know, away from a notion of axia, of intrinsic worth, towards, you know, a, a notion of needs that seems to appear. Yeah. Right? So different needs require different treatments, and that's perfectly consistent with treating people equally. So I wonder whether there's more continuity maybe um, than you allowed for, or what precisely the rupture consists in? So again, that's a very rich question, and I, there's a lot I want to say in response, but let me um, try to prioritize. Uh, so, uh, absolutely. So part of the project, and maybe this is where I'm putting my political theory hat on, so, that, so the lectures are very much going to be historical. This is me in my intellectual historian mode primarily, but there's also, this is also a political theory project. And one of the things I'm interested in is just how badly the presumptive egalitarianism of modern moral and political philosophy fits the phenomena, <laughs> right? We seem to invoke equality language a lot in political theory in places where it doesn't seem to apply. <laughs> because as you say, the reality is quite a, re a reality of unequal or differential treatment. Now someone like Ronnie Dworkin, is going to handle this by simply saying, oh, well, there's a, dis there's a difference between treating people equally and treating people as equals. Right. Yep. I, was, I, was, I wouldn't forget Dworkin, don't worry. <laughs> right. Um, yep. right? Wheelchairs for people who need wheelchairs, that's treating them equally. If you don't need a wheelchair, you don't get a wheelchair, and you can't complain you weren't treated equally. Absolutely, right. And so this is where the kind of uh, neo-Kantian language of equal respect becomes this sort of lingua franca <laughs> of political theory. We can understand kind of all normative claims in a way of sort of, a, of recognizing basic equality through equally respectful treatment. One of the things that I like about the 17th century is because it sort of helps us see the awkwardness of the equal respect idea. That's one of the reasons why I'm so interested in things like hat honor and the recognition of differential status. <laughs> Um, what, does it, what would it mean to respect people equally? Well, we're going to see the Quakers try to do that tomorrow. It doesn't work very well. Um, 
So yeah, so partly this is the move is to say, well, if we look at the way that these issues are being worked out in the 17th century, we can actually come to see that our theoretical language doesn't fit the phenomena in the way we would want it to. But then the sort of the step beyond that, the normative argument, if you will, if you will is actually, I think we are in this post-egalitarian moment where we, certainly young progressives, maybe young conservatives as well, maybe people here can tell me, I'm not young anymore, so I wouldn't know, um, <laughs> are disillusioned with equality. So equality language is actually in somewhat bad odor today. So there's so Marx turned to equity language, right? We want equity. And in a way, I think what equity language is trying to do is recapture some of these ideals of differential treatment. Um, but as you say, right, what's interesting about it is that it's a kind of, uh, instead of talking about differential worth, we talk about differential need in the side of like the way we prioritize in a way inversely relative to um, abilities and things like that. So that, so I think maybe, maybe we're just sympathetic and it, sort of making explicit some of the kind of uh, theoretical background here will help. But um, in a way, maybe uh, I'm sort of trying to both subvert but also save equality talk and say that actually there is an important claim here, maybe the parity claim, and if we reintroduce some distinctions, it can help us see what's important about that claim and why it can't be reduced to this Dworkinian equal respect language. Yes, sir. Thanks. So one thing I was wondering about, um, so you, you talked uh, early on about the sort of non-presence of genealogical uh, critiques of quality. And so you mentioned this, this line from Bernard Williams, which was, which was very nice. And so one place I would have thought is, um, Big criticism was Williams's um, hero, really, uh, way way up in the pantheon is, is Nietzsche, right? So like Nietzsche's just he says, look, the the problem with this Christian model is you're just inverting this. Um, so uh, you you know he who is high in this life will be low in the next life, and so on. And you know that's not affirmative, and, and this this sort of um, trouble, and so on. And then it seemed like your line, and but you didn't go in the skeptical direction, and I was wondering why, because it seems like you gave us all the building blocks of a sort of skeptical logic 101 fallacy here, right? So I'll just put it two ways. So one way is just that, look, you started out with premises for equality, and you ended up with a conclusion with parity, the reason why you're doing this, it's a fallacy of equivocation. Here's why. Um, you just didn't distinguish the two senses of um, equality there. Or if you want to do it sort of Ronnie Dworkin's way, since you just brought that up now, it's like going from you know treating people equally to treating people as equals. Um, you're just going to be committing a fallacy. And so like logically, the argument's no better than like Winnie the Pooh, you know, People say that nothing is impossible, but I do nothing every day, right? Like, <laughs> like it just seems like you've given us all the resources to be really skeptical without some sort of like super principle they're not going to be able to get from the premise to the conclusion. There's, so wh why not go in that direction? Yeah. Um, Thanks for that. So when I said, um, when I noted the absence of genealogical scrutiny, I didn't mean to say genealogy in the Nietzschean or Foucauldian sense. Like I don't, I don't mean genealogy as a debunking exercise. I mean genealogy just as the kind of, the tracing of the evolution of concepts over time. But certainly I am interested in the way that a lot of historical work on the people that I'm talking about. So tomorrow will be the sort of classic case I'll we'll talk about, about the, the Marxist historiography on the diggers and the Quakers and the way that historians have presented them in the 20th century. Um, there is always a kind of implicit normative argument that's going on that's either a critical argument in the case of the levelers, if you're McPherson, or a kind of laudatory argument if you're Christopher Hill and talking about the diggers. Um, but as you observe, I'm not engaged in the debunking exercise. You sort of ask why not, maybe, is that a way of saying it? I've, I've identified a fallacy, so why not? Sorry? Sorry, the, the, the pieces are there. The pieces are there. 
just pull the trigger. Right. Um, well, so why, why not? I mean, I am interested in pointing out the fallacy. Uh, it's, I, I'm pointing it, that's certainly part of the book. But I think maybe this is why I'm a political theorist and a historian of political thought as opposed to a philosopher. Like, I don't actually think the important thing is for the argument to be sound. <laughs> the argument can work and not be particularly sound. And as a political theorist, I want to understand the ways in which arguments work. Um, so that's... Ter Teresa, I got <laughs> lost. Okay. By work, you mean were effective in their historical context? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So I pointed to the sort of the, we'll say the, the minute example of Lilburn and his treason trial, but what's so interesting is that the language he uses catches on so quickly. And when we come to Locke on Wednesday, I think it's right to say that Locke really is theorizing a kind of practice that's been going on for decades, and so that you really should read Locke in the second treatise, for instance, in light of kind of these leveler arguments. He's trying to make them work, right? Uh, Jeremy Waldron will argue that he does. He makes them work. These are good arguments. Um, I'm more interested in the ways in which the practice kind of leave their mark on the theory and produce sorts of problems with respect to women, I think is the, is the, the um, famous example. But we yeah. We have time for one more question. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. So I'm curious, it's always seemed to me that the reformational doctrines of the priesthood of all believers in sola scriptura are a very important part of this leveling process. So even if you didn't have, this is kind of a ridiculous universe to think about, but even if you didn't have verses like Genesis 1, and the passage from Acts 10, the mere fact that you have people thinking they have to read the scripture for themselves and understand it and argue among themselves, and you start seeing literacy rates take off in Protestant countries, that this would have an important leveling impact. So I'm just curious what you think about the role of those two doctrines and what you see going on among the levelers. Mm, so there's a story that can be told and gets told about how what's distinctive, I mean, what really matters about the levelers is not the kind of amateur legal exegesis it's the fact that Lilburn, Overton, Walwyn, et cetera, are all members of the radical congregations. They're all Anabaptists, basically. And they're in this kind of radical theological stew. And again, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that stew tomorrow. Um, so clear, I mean, this is, Protestantism matters. I would sort of say, you know, in the spirit of my first book, also Protestantism is not a homogenous monolith. There are quite a lot of differences and arguments about what's being made. Um, and the arguments about, not the priesthood of all believers, but the um, sort of what gets called mechanic preaching. So the idea that anyone can preach because we all have access to the spirit. That becomes really important, but that breeds its own understandings of uh, the relevant hierarchies that should govern that preaching. So, for instance, in the Quakers, we're going to see arguments about, well, yes, Christ is all in all, and some friends are more advanced <laughs> in their degree of light than others. Uh, so there, again, I just want to say, yes, and I'm interested in the varieties. I do think I'm guilty, though, of downplaying the religious arguments in this book relative to maybe my first book, which was... But maybe, maybe, maybe that's actually, anyway, a lot, I am really, there's a lot of the Bible in this, but maybe not so much about the, um, the uh, congregational context. Okay, we're going to hit the pause button now. <laughs> Lecture two coming up. Please join me in thanking Teresa. Burke.